All right, we're live. Tapping birdie, RBC Heritage Masters recap. I'm with Brian Mull, first time guest. We got two Brian's on the pod um, this week for the first time, I think. Um, but I want to have you on the pod. I followed you for a while. I, I know you're you're in the the golf gambling Twitter space, but I really don't know much about you. I know that you played Augusta National from your your profile picture, which is which is sick. I know you're a caddy on the PGA Tour, and I know you like to bet. So I, I want to give you time to do a little bit of an introduction and tell a little bit more about yourself and, um, you know, your caddy career and, and how you got into to betting on golf. Yeah, all of those things are true. Uh, Brian, I appreciate you having me on. I've followed you for a while as well, and uh, we've had some good uh, banner here, here and there. Uh, yeah, I've been fortunate uh, – my life in golf has really gone back. My father was a club pro uh, at a golf course in uh, Eastern North Carolina uh, designed by Ellis Maples, who was kind of a Donald Ross protege. Um, and uh, so I grew up with around it, you know, probably had a golf club in my hand at age two or whatever, and uh, played at a decent level through uh, junior and uh, amateur golf. Um, yeah, went to college, played golf in college, and was young and kind of uh, looking for something to do. Working as an assistant pro at a golf course, was working a million hours a week, and had the opportunity to go out and caddy in 1996 with a guy, a longtime member of the PGA Tour from my hometown named Clarence Rose, uh, going back old school, a guy that was on tour in the 80s and 90s. Uh, he asked me to come out. We had played some golf together in the winter and he was struggling a little bit and said, Hey, you want to come out and, and loop for me for a couple of weeks? And, uh, I said, sure. It's better than what I've got going on here. And, uh, that's kind of how it started. I ended up staying out there full time for seven years. Uh, 96 was obviously a big year. It was the year of tiger turn pro. Uh, I was there for all of those events. I, I walked over in Milwaukee, uh, we had finished up and uh, he was going out late in the afternoon and I walked over and watched him hit his first tee shot there at, you know, the Milwaukee open. That was such a big deal. And just uh, the being a part of all that. And then was in Las Vegas, obviously where he got his first win beating Davis love in the playoff and the rest is history for, for him. And uh, so I got through 2002 and then I moved to Wilmington, North Carolina from North Carolina Um just uh, felt like, you know, down here by the beach be a good spot. And uh, the town is, was, was kind of small then. It's grown a lot in the last 20 years. And gotten into the media side of things, writing about golf. Uh, worked full-time at the newspaper here for eight years, uh, part-time for a while before that. And uh, basically for the last decade have, have, have freelanced, you know, writing golf for everybody from the athletic to USA Today and Golf Week, been part of their team covering the Masters uh, several years. And, uh, you know, got into doing some like fantasy and betting columns about four or five years ago. And, you know, it's always been something that uh, has been interesting to me, something I've always followed my whole life, you know, not only golf, but basketball and football. And then as it's become more, you know, widespread accepted or whatever, it's certainly, uh, a lot of folks looking for content about it and uh it's a nice way to nice way to watch a golf tournament uh it is the best way to watch a, a golf tournament I, I truly think that having a guy in the mix and uh, having an outright sweat or a first round leader or a top five sweat it it makes the golf a lot more um enjoyable and, and a lot more uh fun to watch so when you were a caddy on the uh, on the PGA Tour, was there like conversations amongst caddy, like always trying to like pick the winner, like not even from a gambling sense, but you know when you're around it so much, there must be some aspect of who you like this week, who's a good course fit, um, who's coming in in hot form, and I'm sure those were conversations had back when you were a caddy on the on the PGA Tour. You know, not as maybe prevalent as you would think. Um, you're you're just so locked into your world, like trying to know the golf course and and figure out where your guy's at with his game. Like all most of your attention is, is focused yeah. on that. You know, like uh, 
hey, did, have they made any, you know, oh, they've changed this on the 15th hole. You might want to go take a look at that, you know, since last year. Conversations were more, were more along those lines. Um, I do know that uh, a few caddies uh, during the Las Vegas stop or the Reno stop, which was a new stop during my my tenure, uh, would, uh, you know, maybe frequent the sports book and uh, place a wager or two, uh, certainly, uh you know, maybe on their own guy or maybe on somebody that they had, seen, had some inside information about. I know that that happened from time to time, but, uh, you know, just the whole idea of betting on golf is just, it's just come so much more to the forefront Yeah, you know, in the last decade. And, um, it was really, it was really something like, like I remember one of the places where you could bet in Vegas. Um, it's actually where Jeff Sherman got started out golf odds on Twitter. And you had to wander like all through the, the, the casino and go back to this tiny little room in the back and they'd have the golf odds up on the board. So um, it's definitely come a long way from there. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it might just be the, the people I, I surround myself with, but <laughs> I mean, like even a lot of the people I work with, like my boss and coworkers and brokers that I work with are always like, who you got for the masters? I'm betting on the masters. Like it's become a lot more prevalent. And I think like we talked about before, like, you know, it's, it's really just the, best sport to bet on it in my um opinion and there's so many different variations of um you know how you can place wagers and there's a lot that you know can go into um certain wagers and everything like that but um i guess i, I also want to ask you what is your connection to augusta national um i've seen you wear the members hat you're, you're playing 12 uh, in your profile picture so what what is your connection to the uh, the Masters and specifically Augusta National? I know you said you've covered it for a number of years, being a, a member of the media. You you've been in the press box, you've been on the grounds, but do you have any special connection to that place? Not really, other than I love it. I've been there uh, about twelve times for the tournament, uh, ten times as a credentialed member of the media, uh, and then fortunately in 2018, as you know, they, they have a lottery where 20. Okay. All right. Yes. Where 24 media members are, are selected. And, uh, <laughs> somehow, I mean, I'm, look, I'm a guy, I've never won. Like I don't win the drawing at the local route. I don't, I'm not lucky in that way. I've been very fortunate in life in many ways, but just, um, nobody was more surprised than I was and had an opportunity to, to, to play the golf course. And, uh, I mean, just, beyond all expectations <laughs> so almost brian like a, and i've told people like it was an out-of-body experience for five the months. whole time it the felt whole time. like from the time that uh you know and, and the way it is is like so our tea, my tea time was 11 a.m at 10 a.m on the dot not at 9 58 but at 10 a.m on the dot you are allowed to enter the gates and drive down magnolia lane and <laughs> um man i i caught like every green light and I had a decision to make like turn right or like go down and turn around. And so it was like nine 59 and um, security guard, you know, big, big, scary security guard comes up and he, he, you know, he's checking me out and showing my card and my invitation to play. And we both knew I was a little early and he said, I just want you to drive real slowly down Magnolia lane. And I said, man, I've been waiting my whole life for somebody to tell me that. So that was uh yeah. So yeah. I'm assuming you're 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 a good golfer. Um, what did you shoot that day? Like, how how was playing the course as an amateur? You know, being like a single digit handicap. Like, what what was your experience playing at 18 at Augusta? Well, from the members tees, it's pretty friendly. Yeah, um, it's only I think it's only like 6,400 yards for the members. It's pretty friendly. A lot of the trouble is not really in play in some ways, but in other ways, like the, you play the golf course more in the way it was designed, in that you have to work the ball a little, or you'll run out of room. If you yeah. know, if you and um, I kind of hit a straight shot and maybe a slight fade. So there's the holes where you really have to turn it off the tee, <laughs> you really have to be able to turn it from that up tee. You yeah. know, if you're back there at 7,500, you can just rip it straight away. Um, the weather wasn't great. It was like 50 degrees when we teed off, you know. Uh, I think I was in a couple of layers all day. Um, I think I ended up shooting 79. Okay. All right. Broke Andy at Augusta. I made three birdies. Um, I missed a <laughs> lot of short pots. I, I mean, that was the, the two things that, that I would tell anybody. Like, having been there many times and feeling like you know the place – but then once you're allowed, like on the actual fairways, like inside, um, 
the two things that, that, that separate Augusta from probably anywhere I've ever played are that you never get an even lie. You never have a flat lie except on the tee box. Yes. <laughs> Often when you have that, that lie, like if the ball's below your feet promoting a fade, it's a shot that you need to hit a draw. Okay. So, so that you, you're dealing with that. And then um, every putt, like, you know, you play and you roll it up there two and a half feet. You just kind of step up to it and tap it in. You're not, you know, tap in birdie, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Every putt's got a little, especially we yeah. were, you, you know, we were playing the Sunday hole locations, which, um, you know, are set on near some ridges. And so every putt, you just had to think, you know, you just had to mark it and step back and, you know, just read it. And like uh, you would have these putts. I had a putt similar to the one Patrick Reed had made on 17. I mean, it was four feet, and it broke probably a cup. And that's just, the that's the biggest thing, like, watching, like, this week. is just like, yo, like, nothing's good at Augusta National, right. like, outside of, like, seven inches. Like, yeah. you cannot just tap it in. And there's not a lot of stops on the PGA Tour, really, no. that you have to play that much break over such short putts, other than some major championship venues like you know winged foot or you know uh, other places like that but you know we saw that this week and like not not to get into it like just yet but like even some of those short putts that scotty missed like they were not bad putts like they were good putts that had to play like outside the hole and it's just that's what a lot of people say max homa talked about it on uh some space um before the week is like you, it's very hard to trust playing a two, three footer with that much break. And that just gives so many guys um, issues around that, uh, around that place. Yeah. I mean, I was, um, I think it was my first round of golf in like seven weeks. I was coming off a stretch where I'd been covering a ton of college basketball, like some of the NCAA tournaments and been on the road and just uh, working, you know, a lot of long hours and, literally threw my clubs in at the last minute thinking maybe, you know, Monday after the tournament, I'll get a chance to play Palmetto or somewhere, you know, on the way back or whatever. And, but golf was, uh, you know, you're working long days, 12 hour to 10, 12 hour days covering the tournament. And um, so, yeah, those short putts when you'd like to be a little more dialed in and a little more confident were certainly uh, a little shaky, but that didn't take anything away from the experience. So I, I, I hit it close on 12 and, Wow. And missed missed about a six and a half footer. But again, it was, uh, you know, Ray's Creek pull and you're sitting there and it's, it looks like it's, uh, you know, left edge and it was probably a ball and a half out on the left. And uh, But you have to hit it with a little conviction. But uh, when they're rolling 13, it's kind of hard to, uh, hard to get yeah. too aggressive. So just uh, such mad respect for those guys. I always have had respect for tour players, but uh, just the level of their skill – it's really hard to appreciate just uh, in the fact that they were doing it all from a thousand yards farther. Just- yeah. Yeah. That makes it a little bit, a little <laughs> bit uh, tougher. So in your days of, of covering the masters and, and going to the masters, I know you said you were, were there for, for a couple of years. What was your favorite masters memory when you were on grounds? What, what do you think is the greatest masters moment um, in your out without tiger winning in 2019? Um, Cause that that's an obvious um, at your time at, at Augusta, what, what was your favorite uh, moment of the of the tournament? Yeah, I mean that's obviously number one. Yeah, yeah. Um, the cool, the the strangest, coolest thing was I covered the 2020 Masters. Yeah, where, where there was nobody. There. Wow. Okay. I was one of the select few. I mean, there were norm. There's normally 400, 500 people in the press center. There were maybe a hundred, all very socially distanced, wearing masks. There were no ropes. I walked on Monday with Tiger, Freddie, J- Justin Thomas, and DeChambeau. And this was DeChambeau a couple of months, you know, when he was changing golf. He was coming a off, favorite. He was a favorite coming, coming into that match. Coming off wing foot. He had just added all this distance. I had not seen him hit it since he had added all this distance and literally walked beside those guys. There were no ropes. We had parameters of where we were expected to stand. Yeah. But like on the 12th tee, I mean, I was – I could have re- re- reached out and, you know, you know you're keeping a distance, but you're, you're a couple of arms lengths away um, from them during a practice round and maybe uh, myself and a couple of other media folks and just how quiet it was. Um, I wrote a piece for the athletic that week about um, you could hear all these noises, 
whether it was the train track, you could hear a church service on Sunday morning. You could hear the music coming from a church that wow. was nearby, things that you would never ordinarily be able to hear because of the, the patrons. And um, it was just, it was surreal. Uh, I compared it to, uh, it was like someone invited you to go uh, watch a movie about a golf tournament be filmed. And so you could be there, but you couldn't say anything. You know, yeah. you were not to be seen or heard. And uh, I remember, like, obviously, DJ was in control, but uh, Cam Smith hit this. He was kind of trying to put some heat on him. And on Sunday, he hit this unbelievable shot from the pine straw on nine to, like, caught the ridge and, and released down to, like, five or six feet. You know, ordinarily, that would be one of the loudest roars that you would hear all day. But because, like, Mickelson and, and Spieth and somebody were on 18 green, the, the, the few people who were gathered around the green didn't want to make – any noise at all. So he just hit the shot in silence um, in a major yeah. championship. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, the tiger being around the green and, and just taking that whole scene in. I mean, I don't know that I'll ever be a part of another moment. That's as cool as that. Yeah. that That's awesome. Like you said, you, you were at his first uh, tour stop and then you saw him win the masters in 2019. So you've really come full circle on, um, on tiger woods, which is definitely cool. Yeah, um, you know, I'm a couple of years older than him. Uh, we competed in one golf tournament against each other. Wow, <laughs> okay. Not against each other. He finished uh, second. Uh, it was a, but it was a big national junior tournament out in Arkansas. Uh, David Duvall was in the field. I think Justin Leonard won. And, and there was a skinny uh, 13 or 14-year-old kid. Um, you know, you may have seen the picture on Twitter. He and John Daly um, it was that it was from that tournament. Okay. Uh, they would bring in 20 tour players on Saturday to play with the guys who made the cut. And uh, Tiger finished second, playing against 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, you know. And uh, this kid from Cypress, California is like, who's this guy? And then, um, you know, I've had a chance to interview him and was paired with him uh, once uh, during the Cadian days, too. So it's, okay. uh, you know, I've watched it all with him. I've seen it, uh, kind of, you know, seen the greatness and, and, and seeing, uh, you know, when he was making some swing changes there in 98 and kind of, kind of struggling a little bit tee to green, but uh, just the, there's never been anybody like him, you know, what, what he's done to golf for golf, uh, this is the presence, uh, the, just the, the, the folks that he's brought into the game. I mean, we can talk about him all night. Yeah, no, uh, you know, I, I honestly think, um, I don't know how many more masters he's going to play, you know, watching him this week. And, and like, he just didn't like, no leg up was talking about it. Like he just didn't have much joy. It seemed like he seemed like very like steady, like not happy. Like it didn't seem like, Oh, well, like that was great. I just played 72 holes at Augusta. Like that must take such a toll um, like on his body. And I think we're kind of getting to the point of his him playing in these majors is not like it doesn't have the same effect it, it used to. And I think, you know, with the amount he's withdrawn um, over the past two years, um, and I'm sure he will withdraw from, you know, one of these majors coming up if he if he even plays them. Um, so it's a bit of a sad time um, in golf to see Tiger like even coming into the week. I really didn't feel like there was really any buzz around Tiger, you know, being in the field, obviously, you know, on grounds, everyone's following him, but it just feels like the excitement factor um, with him coming back at least has, has kind of worn up a little, worn off a little bit. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a difficult walk, obviously everybody knows yeah. that. I mean, and uh, the, the pressure that he has to put on the, the leg that was compromised in the, in the car crash, like, you know, he can't really even simulate that, I'm sure, like yeah. even in the gym or at home and just the shots that you have to hit and the recovery that he needs. It's uh, We're definitely watching the end of an era. I mean, it's super impressive what he was able to do on Friday, just his genius for being able to yeah. leave the ball in the right spot and, and get it grinded out like he did so many times. But it's, it, it is ceremonial. He bristled at that when asked about it Tuesday in the press center, but – essentially that's what it's become. I don't think yeah. anybody, anybody with realistic, reasonable thoughts, uh, you know, he, if had he not been in that auto accident, uh, you know, I think he probably could have strung together a few more majors where he was in the hunt, but 
I, yeah. I just, that's asking a lot to come back. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So there was a golf tournament last week. The Masters was last week. Um, I, I'd say overall, you know, I think it was a, a pretty good Masters, a pretty compelling Masters. You know, I think that whatever, 72 minus nine, like that many holes were really great. And it felt like a few guys had a chance to win. And I kind of pointed it out at the beginning of the week is that we've ha- not since 2019 have we had a really great Masters where – a lot of guys could win on Sunday. It, it really has been the most dominant player in the game outside of Hideki kind of running away with the tournament. Now it took Scotty a little bit longer to get to that point than, you know, when he won two years ago or DJ or, or Rom it, it being a two horse race uh, last year. But, you know, I think the conditions were great. You know, I think, on the PGA tour this year, we've seen a lot of softening of the conditions and a lot of making the golf course a little bit easier for these guys. So it was nice to see Augusta national really ramp up the firmness and how they were kind of able to um, change the course, even after um, they got some rain on Wednesday night into Thursday morning. So, uh, you know, I thought the conditions of the course were excellent. The wind made it that much more compelling And I think that, you know, for, I mean, even like, you know, with seven holes left, eight holes left, like it it really did seem, you know, it seemed inevitable Scotty was going to win, but there were still a few guys that that had a chance. They were all big names. Yeah. I mean, what we're watching right now with Scotty is is, is truly, uh, it's a historic stretch. And, uh, you know, maybe from a wins perspective, you could say he's, slightly underachieved overall when you look at this run he's been on since the fall of 22 but but when you start to really hammer it out to, to the tournaments that he has won uh, winning the players back to back you know winning winning the masters two times in three years um, I, I agree with you the golf course conditions it was the first time in a long time that it's been firm uh you know there's just been epic rain there uh through the week or on the weekend the last few years so i thought the golf course played great uh I was, yeah, I was so hopeful <laughs> when they were all on about number eight yeah. on Sunday, you know, and, but, but when Scheffler made the putt for birdie on eight yeah, and my work, was in there close and he was going to make his, you know, you felt like to time and the other guys were going to be a shot behind that. I, it just, it hit me. It was like, Scotty has, has scuffled to this point. He's hit some uncharacteristic iron shots that have not gone the right distance. Um, been a little sloppy, you know, by his standards, didn't birdie the second hole. And yet here he is with a share yeah. of the lead with yeah. 10 holes to go. And like, who do you trust to play? It's kind of like the NCAA basketball tournament. Like, you know, these teams have ratings that they develop over the season. But then once you get into the tournament, which coach, which group of players do you trust to perform to that level or maybe even slightly above that level underneath this microscope? And yeah. in basketball, it's been, it was UConn the last couple of years. And it's been it's Scotty Scheffler. When when the heat gets turned up, like he may not perform above his level, but if he just performs anywhere close to it, it's, be- it's so much better than everybody yeah. else. And uh, I, I just get more and more impressed with his short game. Yeah, and that and that won it for him these past two masters. He won, like in 2012. I vividly remember he got everything up and down. And I think that's what a lot of people are kind of realizing what's got it. I know, I know it's known, but um, like he's an unbelievable ball striker. Everyone talks about the ball striking sets. Everybody talks about, you know, the driving and the irons, but he's also has arguably the best short game on the entire tour. So when you see, you know, whatever, he finished top 15, top 20 in approach, which is not good for him. But when you have that good of a short game that a lot of these top guys don't have, it just, there's no holes in his game, obviously with the putter. But now, I mean, he's making putts. And what you talked about with that putt on eight, what I realized watching Scotty is that he was a, he, he was a big momentum guy this week. Once he got a little bit of momentum, he was running downhill, but he started a little bit slow on Saturday and Sunday. You know, he, he wasn't playing his best golf by any means, but I think everyone watching was like, you know, through seven holes. Scotty does not look as dominant as we thought, but he made, which I knew in the moment, was a very pivotal putt on eight, about eight feet for birdie. 
And then he goes um, on nine. I was watching back. Everyone was trying to do what Scotty did on nine. Like it, everyone is trying to hit that exact shot. And no one even came close. Like no, no one even put it to three, four feet. And he, 100 yards, wedge in his hands, hits a dime on the green, probably could have hit it to a tap in. 10, birdie 10 twice. 10 used to be, I mean, talk about rolling the ball back. 10 used to be like a hard hole where yeah. guys are hitting like three, four irons in. And Scotty Scheffler, who's not one of the longest guys on tour, probably hit pitching wedge, sand wedge, gap wedge for two birdies into that green. To make birdie on 10 twice, I mean – he kind of once he made that putt and felt a little confidence. I mean, he was just running downhill, and it was awesome to watch. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you pointed out the ninth hole. I think uh, I love that. I think it's a, one of the best holes on the golf course. Okay, uh, underrated, uh, underrated hole. So underrated. Nobody wants to talk about this. Like, there's so many factors. Like, see, you know, if it's into the wind or soft, they're back there hitting off the side hill wire but even when it's downwind and firm and they're down there 100 yards like you say like there's no gimmies there's so many things that you have to be able to control to get that ball close you have to be able to control the strike the trajectory and the spin and <laughs> look this is like top level phd golf you know to be able to do that i mean there was a, and, and not not to, to crack on rory but like i think Playing with Scotty the first two days, it was just apparent the difference in the level of the control of their golf ball. Because yeah. the ninth hole, there was a similar situation with the hole in the back tier. I think it was in the second round, maybe the first round. And Scotty leaves it perfectly pin high, just in the just in the fringe, but like 15 feet. With yeah. the, the, the and he had a great ball. shot in there. I remember that. He was on a severe down slope, and it was just like – into just the wind, like was, the bullet, yeah, yeah, just beautiful shot. And then Rory kind of hits this floater, you know, that comes up and lands in the in, into the ridge and, and funnels back. I mean, it's a fine golf shot. He's fifty feet. He's probably going to escape with a two putt par. But just uh, just those little the little differences like that. I mean, here's a guy that's. It's not like we're comparing him to the guy who's number one hundred in the world. Yeah, <laughs> we're comparing him to a guy who's who's been a top five player for the last decade. And. Yeah. Um, He's uh, he's just on another level. He just I, I think he's unlocked something. The no laying up guys were talking about this, um, in, in that Scotty's just playing golf more so than anybody else. Like he is certainly working on his golf swing and has his instructors and has his things that he wants to work on when he's practicing. But when he steps on the first tee, he's just balling. He's yeah. competing. He's not afraid of any shot. Whether yeah, like Sally talked about, like he's actually being athletic. Yeah. Like he's trying to swing his body in an athletic way to just make it do what he needs to do. Um, I, I, you know, I will say, you know, we were talking about Scotty. Everyone's talking about Scotty. You know, to me, and this happens in a golfer's career, you got to do more and more and more. To me, it's a knock on his career, and I'm curious your thoughts, that – his nine PGA tour events have come on five courses and they've come in three months of the calendar year. I, again, everyone said he needs another major. He got another major, but the masters is the same course every year to me, to Scotty, to really level up. He needs to win a PGA us open or an open championship or the Memorial or St. Jude or at East Lake. Like Scotty at this point in his career, he has his five, four courses because the match play doesn't exist anymore that he is going to be dominant at because they are so perfect for his game. Waste management, Bay Hill, players, masters. Like These are spots Scotty is going to be contending at for a very long time. But to me, you got to win at a variety of golf courses. And I know those four are different, but it is weird that he's only won in three months of the year. No, I agree. I, I saw that tweet earlier and, uh, you know, I hadn't really thought about it that closely. I mean, obviously – know that he's he's had some great early stretches the last few years um counterpoint i will say that tiger won a large majority of his tournaments at a handful of golf courses but yeah. i agree with you he needs to win a different major it doesn't matter which one it is um if he wants this season which has every uh right uh to be kind of considered with some of the great seasons we've ever seen but if he wants this season to be on that level he's got to win at least one more major 100 um, if, if not two um, I mean, if you really want to separate yourself 
and uh, you know he needs to uh, to prove that this putting that he's found is something he can sustain. Uh, yeah. You know he can obviously make those putts at Augusta. He has confidence. I think that's the, the beauty of that place. Whereas you see guys who come in early and they get a win. And uh, they continue to play well there throughout their careers, some even into their 50s and 60s. And then you have other guys that, uh, you know, once they have those nightmares, whether it's Greg Norman, Rory McIlroy, uh, Tom Wisecott. I mean, there's been so many guys through the years that just the bad memories start to pile up and the pucks yeah. keep flipping out. So, um, yeah, I agree. He needs to uh, continue it, sustain it. You know, obviously it's a Different scenario this year with his first child on the way, and um, you know, gotta play a factor. I mean, come it's on, going to change like, his life. I mean, seriously, you know, I have three kids of my own. I'm, I'm kidding, yeah. but like, <laughs> you having a kid affects fucking everybody. I yep. don't care what you say or what if he ha- has a kid and like still like levels up and plays his game. Like that's a big because that I mean, there's a lot of things you could brush off your shoulder. Having a kid changes your life, and it's impacted a lot of golfers' career negatively like there's just no doubt in my mind about it no doubt no doubt i mean i think he has a lot going for him to sustain this just his his personality yes. and, and his motivation you know and all those things but um yeah family changes you and uh, as i do have two daughters and you start to worry and think about things you used to never think about you know and maybe that carries over to the golf course a little bit too i don't yeah know. and but it takes like, a lot of time you're up in the middle of the night like you yeah. can't practice as much like I, to me, like, and I talked about it, like, there's just certain guys that Augusta is very nice to. And, you know, we've seen certain, I'm not comparing him to, to you know, Angel Cabrera and Bubba Watson and, you know, Jordan Speed, but there's certain guys that just fuck at Augusta National and it's a very happy place for them. And like you talked about, there's guys that it's just not really for them. And this felt, to me, like the most inevitable major for Scotty to win. I am not personally like I can't bet a regular market at the PGA and U.S. Open. I don't think that Scotty is just going to win the PGA and he's just going to win the U.S. Open. Like that, he I did feel like that way about the Masters. So, um, still obviously he's unbelievable, but I'm still kind of in like, yo, you need to win a, uh, an event outside of three months. Like win Memorial, win one of the USO. I don't think you can. I think the var- the Open. There's too many variables. Like I would not scared to stand in front of Scotty at the Open Championship, in, in my honest opinion. But um, yeah, I mean, still, I still think that, um, like you said, you know, win another elevated event, and uh, hopefully he doesn't fall into the other um, thing. Is after guys win the Masters, it takes them a while to win again. John Rahm has not won since. Like. Winning the Masters, Scotty, it's different. Like, you usually go on a little bit of a rut. So, I think it's kind of different with him, but um, we shall see. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's where it falls on the schedule. You know, you think about it. Last major was in July. Got all this time. Everybody starts to, you know, you're building towards it for months. And guys don't, you know, they're practicing certain shots for it and thinking about the holes and what they need to do and climb that mountain. Um, it's just, sometimes it's hard to get back up, but, uh, I think he has made his presence known that, uh, you know, his impact on a leaderboard is a little Tiger-esque, you know? Yeah. We saw and he, Tiger- I mean, he looked like you or me playing a Muni out there in his demeanor. Yeah. I mean, he showed zero emotion at any point during that, right? Yeah. No emotion. Like, just as calm as could be. And I, I thought that definitely played a factor um, into it. Out of Colin Ludwig... And Homa, who were you most, and Bryson, who were you most impressed with out of those four um, this week? I felt like going into this year that Bryson was going to win a major this year. I did not yeah. think it would be the Masters based on his record there. I was impressed with how he played the golf course. Um, I don't think it's the best fit for his skill set. You know, yeah. um, I think he likes places with long grass. And, you know, where he can hit it 340 in the rough when everybody else is hitting it 300 in the rough and um, kind of, you know, he's a great putter. But I think that the iron play re- required there, I don't think, you know, it, it, the new irons worked for a couple of days and then they didn't seem to work quite as well on the weekend. I was impressed with him and I was extremely impressed with Max, uh, you know, on a course that maybe doesn't isn't a great fit for him in some ways, but just his demeanor. The way he managed it, 
back to back top tens now in majors should kind of put some of those things to yeah. bed. Um, but look, if you didn't enjoy watching Ludwig play on Sunday, then there's really something wrong with you because this guy, just the way he steps up and just crushes the golf ball, 330 right down the middle, his demeanor, he's so endearing, just as he's laughing and smiling, yeah. and his caddy Joe. Like you said, he, I mean, this is Sunday at Augusta, and this is your first time there, and you're supposed to be nervous. I'm sure he was on the inside, but his outward appearance was that of joy, where so many of the top pro golfers look like they're about to go get a root canal yeah. where they play golf. And, like, he looked like he was enjoying the experience and the opportunity. And, uh, the, you know, we, we all know his talent and what he's capable of. And uh, the future for him is just um, – it's incredible. I mean, yeah. I think like this is a guy that could be, I mean, if not for Scott, he could be number one in the world in a very short yeah. period of time. Yeah. So I, I I wouldn't normally go into this detail on one hole of one golfer, but you were a caddy 11. Like they, they that was pretty documented, their conversation. Do you think he had a bad shot? Were they going for the green? Is there something you do as a caddy and just say, yo, hit this right and just try and chip up and make bogey? Like, what did you think about his shot on 11 and maybe that caddy interaction before? And, you know, what what, what is your overall take on that? I think he pulled the shot, obviously. Okay. And the wind um, was going there. Yeah, I think he pulled it. But I do think that, especially that mounding that they added a couple of years ago on the right, that you can play that shot as long as you don't get too deep, like beyond pin high, you can play it short right and end up in a pretty friendly spot. Exactly what Scotty did. And eliminate six. Because yeah. a five on 11 at Augusta is never going to kill you. It's not ideal. But, um, you know, generally when you're playing that well, that means, I mean, he led the field in putting. He should have had a lot of confidence in that club. And I would have looked at it as like, worst case scenario here, I'm going to have an eight-footer for four. And the greens are perfect, and I'm rolling it good, and I'm going to make it. Yeah. But I'm not going to add any. Now is not the time. Not with 13, 15, uh, you know. the 14 with that pin. 14's a birdie pin. 16's a birdie pin. Like, you, you have – we've seen it with guys just going to tear through the middle of the back part of that the, the back nine. And, um, you know, I, I think it was just a poor swing. I'm sure he was feeling great. You know, things were going right. And uh, – I thought Joe did a good job, but but maybe you know it's it's easy to caddy from the couch, um, but but you would just maybe be committed there to a line a little farther right than yeah. uh, than, than normal. I mean, Ben Hogan said it years ago. I know they were playing with different equipment, but um, you know he said if, if you see the pin there and you see me on the green, I've pulled it. Yeah, and, um, you know, there's you can make a four. You can still play another hole from over there on the grass on the right. Yeah, no, I, I definitely when I play Gusta, I will keep that in mind and i'll just because i i've been there i've just nuked a six iron left like thousands of times in my life so i i felt for love there but yeah i mean to me like again i i hate to he's unbelievable like he is top five player in the world like i know we just started he's got to win something soon like i'm sorry like he won the rsm as the favorite like he was the best player in the field like he's got to win something soon before he's like a top three player in the world right now. Like I understand it's hard to win. Like I know Xander doesn't win. I know like, but still like he's got to win something soon. I know he has the capabilities. Maybe it's this week. He loves short courses, but um, yeah, Max was kind of interesting to me because after the Ryder cup, I, you know, we've seen guys level up after the Ryder cup, Justin Rose in 2012. Um, there's been a lot of Scotty, you know, in 2021, like there's a lot of people have kind of leveled up after they've had a strong, Ryder Cup performance and Max had that strong Ryder Cup performance, but he wasn't playing great golf. I mean, he just wasn't by any metrics. He had some good finishes, but it wasn't terrible. But to see him first major of the year, not in great form, place he's been, you know, decent at, like that was really impressive to me. And I'm, I'm, I was high on him to start the year and I'm very high on him really, you know, being in the mix at, at some majors this year getting a, an elevated event win um, this year. So I think the PGA Tour needs it. Um, they need Homa in the mix. They need Homa contending. They need their stars playing well, and I think he could be that. So I was impressed with him. I'm happy for him, and I'll Vic lap him playing well at a major um, this year because I, I, I was high. Um, 
on that. And and Colin, he's always tinkering. He's always like figuring something out. And then he plays well for a couple rounds and it, it all comes crashing down. But another guy, the PGA tour needs to get in the mix. I like when Colin's playing well, he's obviously a very dominant player and can be. So I'm hoping to see a little bit more from him, but let's get into the RBC heritage um, elevated event this year, smaller field, Hilton head Island. You've looped there a couple times. Obviously the game's changed a little bit, but what are your overall thoughts on this course? What type of players to target and, uh, you know, what, what you're looking for this week from, from specific golfers. Yeah. I love the golf course. Um, you know, it, it's not to go too far back, but like, it's almost one that was better suited to the old equipment in a way <laughs> because you can work it around and move it around. And, and so now, um, y- you know, it, it's, it's a course where you're going to end up with a lot of approach shots in that 160, 170, 180 range, just by the nature of the golf course. I think it has four of the best par threes on the PGA tour. I think you, you have to avoid disaster on a couple of them, uh, especially um, number four, Early it is a real uh, kind of uh, litmus test type of hole of where you are with your ball striking. You know, one one's pretty straightforward. Two, two's a pretty a hole you should birdie. And then uh, you know you get to four, you've got to hit a quality golf shot there. It's tricky with the wind. Um, old caddy told me there on my first visit, you got to listen. You got to listen for the wind here. I always try to keep that in mind because um, you kind of hear it blowing through the Spanish moss on the trees. Uh, I think it takes a pretty all round skill set. You know, when you look back at, when you look back at guys, it's a lot of control players, what we would consider control players as opposed to power hitters. When you go way back, I mean, a lot of major champions, a lot of some of the best ball strikers to ever, whether it was a Tom Watson or Johnny Miller, you know, Nick Price, people of that nature to win. But, um, you know, when I look at this course now, obviously I want somebody with a good history here. I think there is a, a decent amount of uh, course history that carries over here and just control off the tee, good drives, you know, um, don't, don't necessarily have to be able to, to blast it 320, but uh, you got to be able to, whether you're, whether you're gearing down and teeing off with a long iron or, or you're teeing off with your driver, you've got to be able to put the ball not only in the fairway, but in the right, right segment. Of the yeah. family with the overhanging with the trees, trees, the way they're angled, you could be blocked out. All the corners and being able to get to the corner pins that they have on on the weekend, um, you've got to be coming in from the right spots, and you you can get the you know it's got a very high up and down percentage. It's very flat. The greens are flat. It's flat around the greens. The bunkers aren't too crazy, except a couple of them. But you've got to leave it in the right spots, like any other golf course too. So you've got to have that control. Um, you know, I had some luck here in the past. I had Fitzpatrick last year. Uh, hat tip to Jeff Feinberg. He kind of uh, he, he pushed me over the edge there. Shout out, that Jeff. One, on that one last year and was able to ride on that train. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 we can get to the card, but, um, you know, I've got a few guys in mind this week. But, yeah, just looking for guys that, that have played well here that kind of just are, are solid, that can gain shots through the bag this week and, so and, was yeah. this the week after when did this become the week after the masters when you looped here when was it in the calendar it was the week after the Masters. it was oh, so it's always been the week after the masters so For a long time i was doing some research earlier today and, and like way back in the 70s it was a two or three week, it was like in mid-march it was like okay. two or three weeks before the masters but um as long as i can remember watching golf in the 80s, it's always was from Augusta to Hilton Head. So do you think that there's an advantage for guys that haven't contended? Like if you contended and you had a chance to win the Masters, are you out to win Hilton Head the next week? I think that's it's asking a lot. Okay. Especially when you look at – I mean, basically that was a U.S. Open last yeah, week. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, yeah that it wasn't like hand- DJ winning at minus 20. I caddied in a handful of U.S. Opens, and I, I told my friends one time, like, if I if you had to caddy in the U.S. Open every week, it wouldn't be fun at all. Because Is it fun to caddy? <laughs> it would not be fun to, because of the just the you have to think yeah so much about the next shot, and um, I, I feel like those guys exhausted, you know, are pretty exhausted mentally. Yeah, and and, and now coming to a course where it's not just point and shoot. There's a, there's a lot of thought. There's a lot of nuance. Tricky, gusty winds again. 
And look, you're going to have to go low. I mean, you know, the scores are generally pretty good here. You're going to have to shoot yeah. four, five under a day to feel like you've got a, got a shot, most likely. Yeah. So, you know, if Scotty wins, cancel the season. I'm not even joking. If he <laughs> fucking wins this tournament, I'm done betting on golf. Like, he cannot win this week. He gained like nine strokes ball striking here last year, which is hilarious, which is just truly so funny. But he really shouldn't win. I don't, I really don't know what else to say. Um, I'm kind of out on Ludwig for what we just talked about. You know, I think that he's dominated on short courses, which you would really wouldn't really expect. I do think he does kind of have the demeanor to, to go out and contend the week after contending in the masters. But like we just talked about for that reason, I'm out Rory, I think, you know, we're both pretty much out on of Xander Cantley, Morikawa, Fleetwood Fitz. You, you betting any of them, you like any of those guys, all have some decent history here, some good finishes here. Um, any of those guys on your betting card or that that you want to target? I snagged a 20 uh, on Cantley okay. Monday. Um, I, I've, I've had a Cantley problem in the past, Brian. I bet him quite a bit last year and uh, swore off of him. I had him, I had him at We've all been there, man. We've all been there. I had him at Riviera um, yeah. and uh, just said, you know, I'm taking a little break from Patrick. And uh, But I like some of the things I saw. Look, he never putts well at Augusta National. Never does. He putted bad again last week. But, but I like his iron game was the, was his second best approach of the season only to Riviera. He's obviously on a course where, uh, you know, the history speaks for itself. He's been dealing with going to fly into private islands for meetings and, you know, all this policy board stuff. Maybe maybe that's quieted down just a little bit and he can focus on golf. He's a little bit under the radar compared to, you know, I think he went off here 12 to one last year with a very similar field. Um, yep. So I'm going to jump it back in with Pat Cantley. I'm going to also get a little insurance with a couple of placements just in case he, you know, gets real close to the lead and starts missing putts again, as we've seen him do many times. Yeah. But, uh, I, I think his game is trending back upward. He, he's too talented to, to just keep kind of scuffling about in the middle of the pack. Yeah, I like that. I like that he didn't really contend that hard last week. And we've seen if you just ride history, guys, here, you know, you'll probably get a sweat. Speed, Fitz, Cantlay, Xander, you know, they, they've all been there. Um, a bunch. Colin, I'm out on just given last week and 20 to 1 for him after his form this year. I'm out on Fleetwood at 20 is a terrible bet. It's just <laughs> absolutely awful um you know this happened already um he contended at um the he the rbc canadian open and then top five at the u.s open and then missed the cut at the travelers like no i'm i think you know whatever 28 30 sure but i, I you know don't think he's gonna win and i'm not gonna bet him a 20 to 1 fits he won last year he's been playing decent um but usually guys on out on back to back Homa, I think you could just cross him off just given contending last week. You know, Plus he said he was going to get really drunk Sunday night. So said, like, said might be a two-day hangover. He's not as young as yeah. he used to be. He's not bouncing back. Like he and when you don't drink for a while and you drink, the hangovers are worse. So um, I'm out um, on Homa. I think he, he gets a win this year at somewhere big. Uh, a guy I've been, you know, back and forth on a lot. Um, but I'm personally fine at 30, 35. Um, he's 28 right now, but I know he's higher on bookmaker and some other places, but, uh, I bet a cam young, um, I got a 38, which I think is, is a really solid number, but I think 28 is still a, a solid showing. Um, he, the biggest thing for me with cam is that he's turned the putter around. He's been putting really well for his standards. And that's always kind of been what's held him back. And I don't know what he did. It's not like a Scottish situation where he fixed the mallet, but the putting has been very solid for cam uh, first round leader here, third here um, two years ago, you know, still, I think I'm not going to say he's a short course guy. I don't think he is, um, but at least, you know, he's shown it before gained ball striking last year, bad around the greens, bad putting, but, you know, he's a guy where, you know, I think he's going to win soon. I think he's learning from all this. And 30 to 1 on him, you know, at this course seems seems like an easy bet for me. Yeah, I bet him at 30 also. Um, he's a guy I've gone back and forth on. I've been having some luck with him and placements 
uh, parlayed uh, he and uh, Sheff, uh, parlayed Scheffler with like four different guys for top ten last week. Figuring half of that was a given. Given. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and was fortunate to hit a couple of them with with Cam being one of them. And uh, yeah, he's playing well. His iron play. If you look at like the last four or five events, it's about as good of a sustained stretch of iron play as he's had. And I, I know Paul Tesori who caddied for him last year. I know Paul really well. And that was uh, really weird. What Paul tweeted after he like split off the bag. I don't know if you remember that. It was just yeah. like. Haven't had as much success as I wanted with Cam, but doing it like Cam to me again, have a cat down. Seems like a difficult guy, a little bit. Like, I think it's a little bit weird to have three caddies in this short, three, four caddies in this short amount of time. I think he's a little bit of a difficult guy, but hopefully it wins for us this week. Yeah, it takes guys a while sometimes when they come out, um, especially like. A lot of guys have never even had a caddy of any, yeah. you know, like in, in their life. Maybe when they go play a nice club somewhere, they've had a caddy for a day. But like learning how to manage that relationship. And um, some guys need to be able to yell at their caddy a little bit just to protect their own confidence and get it off their chest. And they've got to know that their caddy can handle that, and not take it personally. And um, there's a lot of dynamics to it. It takes a while. Cam's a pretty quiet guy. Yes. When I've been around him, you know, and he, He's pretty serious out there. He's not, you know, not, he's not laughing and smiling like Ludwig would be. And, you know, Paul's a very talkative caddy, very communicative guy. And I just, you know, wonder there. Um, you never know. I was, I was hopeful that that would be a good partnership. But uh, yeah, it seems like hopefully this is a week for Cam. He's going to win. I mean, there's no question in my mind. He's going to win. He's going to win a lot of tournaments. But uh, I've been saying that for for, for about a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Honestly, I think this could be a good spot for Wyndham. I'm worried he peaked a little bit, but we've seen him play well on club down courses. Um, you know, you know, he really, in my opinion, he has no weakness in his game. Um, the irons have really picked up. It's great short game, great putter. Um, you know, 35 to one on a guy that's, you know, arguably a top five player in the world, missed cut at the gust that kind of like that on a win equity place. I like that bet for me, um, you know, and I don't have to talk about, you know, what he's done. Who, who do you like out of any of the Thieg's, Henley, Lowry, Connors type guys and any of those guys you bet, any of those guys you like? I bet Lowry. I was able to snag a 75. Yeah, that's a great number. I couldn't believe it. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to – I have to. You know, he's been playing fine. Cannot he's putt. Like, <laughs> cannot putt. This is a place where he's played well in the past. Um, you know, he, he can win. He's kind of due, you know, he's knocked on the door a lot. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, 70, it was just a no brainer, the number there. I mean, I think, uh, it, it's, um, you know, placement value as well there with, with a couple of different bets and, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, Shane can keep it going. I mean, his approach yeah. play is unbelievable right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, he, um, you know, he, he can just – my thing with Shane is I feel like he, like, mentally – we all do this, right, and play golf. Like, you're, we're going along in a, a couple of holes, and next thing you know, we've messed up our score with a bogey and a double, and we're going, what happened? I feel like Shane has a little bit of that, maybe his attention span, or I don't know what it is, but he just will kind of drift off for 30 minutes, and that can keep be the difference between winning a tournament or not. So um, I think the key for him is just to kind of keep it together, 72 holes and uh, hang around and – uh, follow his buddy Fitzpatrick into the winner's circle. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I had him when he chipped into the water two years ago. <laughs> um, easily should have won that tournament. You yeah. know, Argue was playing as, as well. And if he could just get a hot putter, I mean, he should be in this um, thing. Kind of moving down, I bet three guys um, you know, in the 60 to 100. Honestly, right now I, I, I've been very busy with work, like I think I'm probably gonna go Cam Young, Wendy, Lowry, and then these three longer shot um, guys. But the three guys I like down the board, I like Sepp Straka. You know, I think Sepp Straka is a guy that you can trust to mix and trust to actually win in big fields. Um, this is a guy with major pedigree, you know, two top fives in majors last year. 
really good ball striker, really accurate off the tee, not a you know power player, as, as you say. Um, has played well here before. There's not a box that Schrocka does not check um, for me. So 66 to 1, that's easy. I like Ben on too. You know, I worry about him closing out tournaments, but I don't know. He played great last week. He's had a good season thus far. I think this is a good course fit. Played well at Sony. Um, I like him and uh, I like Posty. I always like Posty, but this is a spot he, he's excelled at. And uh, he was showing some life last week. So who do you like kind of longer shot above 50 to one to uh, to a hundred? Yeah, I'm riding with you with Poston. Um, I, I think for him, like 30th at, the, at Augusta is like really good. Like, I mean, yeah. like it's, it would be like winning for him would be top 10 or top 15. Yeah. Just, he's so far behind on every par four with the clubs that he's having to hit and not even be able to go at the whole location sometimes. Certainly can play well here. I, I like backing guys in this range who can just black out with the putter. We've certainly seen him do that, We've seen him play great at similar courses like Sedgefield and YY and you know any any type of, of course of this nature uh, i like I, I like him a lot um i grabbed some taylor moore as well red state you play taylor moore in red states you know <laughs> taylor moore he's been uh you know he's just been uh, kind of what i was talking about earlier with the all around like he's just gaining shots through the back um been real steady this year making cuts um no super high finishes but seems like a guy that's okay he's got the win under his belt He's settling in. He's feeling like he belongs. He's starting to get into these elevated signature events. Like, um, you know, could potentially end up being a top 30 type player on the US PGA Tour. Yeah. And then another number grab was uh, I snagged a 120 on Lucas Glover. Okay. Um, I mean, here's a guy that won back to back tournaments yeah. last year, right? And, uh, he, you know, you talk about a flusher. I mean, he can absolutely the sound the US sound Open is, champ. The sound it makes coming off his club, but uh, you know he's he's seventy seven on data golf, data golf. So uh, to grab him at one twenty, this feels like uh, if nothing else, I've got some very nice closing line value this week, Brian. Yeah, I honestly I like Glover. You know, I think he probably got his wins, but like you said, similar to Poston, for him to whatever top twenty, top thirty at the Masters, like big win for for lucas glover i mean that that takes just shows how dialed his irons and uh you know short game and, and putting um has been i'm more of the camp he probably got his wins but you know 120 no no issue with me but 66 a little bit tough to um to stomach i think one of my favorite bets of the week is keegan at 100 okay. um like to me he played great last week like Gain like three, four strokes on approach. Gain putting at the Masters. Not a spot he usually plays well at. Can win. Um, guy I trust in the mix. Has won an elevated event the week after a major before. Um, contended at Sony. You know, I, I, it's a short course. I'm not going to say it's, you know, a perfect comp course. But similarly, it's ball strikers plays. You know, not a ton of history here. I think that's maybe a bit of a knock on for like, but Keegan a hundred is like a very, very easy bet um, for me this week. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a guy that can win tournaments. Um, I thought he was going to have a fantastic year with the way he started out in Hawaii. And, you know, he, he has struggled a little bit, maybe didn't have quite as many high finishes as we would think in Florida that he can have. But, uh, you know, when, when Keegan's in that zone and locked in, like he thinks he can beat anybody in the world. You know, and yeah. uh, we've seen it, and uh, I, I would, yeah, I, I think that's a great play there at 100. Anyone else you like? I like a couple of these guys. I don't know to win or is more just, you know, I think there's value in the placements. Um, my guy, Bezaden Hout. Yeah, um, I think he's top 20. He's been playing great. You know, his iron game just keeps getting better and better. I actually followed him in 2020 at Augusta. It's the first time I'd ever seen the guy. He was paired with Justin Thomas, and I was writing about Justin. Um, and so I walked 18 holes, me and, like, Mike Thomas and 12 other people. And uh, I was impressed with just the way he carried himself, um, how steady he was. He just looked like a professional at that point. Even though he was kind of green and young, like, you could tell that this guy, had he'd already – 
put a few wins under his belt around the world. And he's just continued to get kind of better. He's obviously a great putter, but the rest of his game has just kind of gradually improved. He went from a guy who was like finishing in the top 40. Now he's like more top 20. We see, you know, we saw him almost win out in the desert. So I, I, I like him quite a bit. And Matthew Pavan, I don't know why the books hate him so much, but uh, they keep giving, giving him pretty friendly numbers, I think. I mean, played great last week. He, he finished third. At he was mixing last week. He won at Torrey Pines. Like, I mean, he just keeps getting it done. And this seems like a, as far as course fit, um, as, as good as there is as far as the elevated events. I like I like those two plays. Um, I think I'm going. Uh, I think I'm going out my card first round later this week. I'm just kind of feeling it. It's a smaller field. Like I don't. There's not a lot of other guys I really like. Like I'm just sticking to it. I'm just gonna bet him first round later because that's been a better um, strategy for me. Quickly, another tournament this week. Corrales. Uh, I vacationed in Putacana a lot. Haven't played the course. It's way too expensive um, for me. But few guys I like on betting. Nate Lashley, Vic Perez, Maddie Schmid, Quest 80. That's a no-brainer. Um, Jimmy Staggs as well. Those are kind of five dudes. I am I. Neesmith 100 to two. That might be a value play for me. I bet Matthew Neesmith at 100 to one in way way better field so and ben martin too ben martin's been first round leader here past two years playing great golf probably too obvious to win but i like ben martin as well any picks for down in punta cana yeah i like um i like lashley and quest about i mean i know quest is your guy uh <laughs> i I, uh, I love him man i mean what's not to like here he is he got in this event off the top 10 he's just grinding He's performing, yeah. you know, he Monday qualifies and he goes out there and puts up numbers and it's really a great course fit for him. Uh, Lashley, of course, won the Corn Ferry Tour event here a few years ago. I like uh, Kevin Yu as well. I think that's a fair number. Shout out RK. Uh, on RK, him. RK loves Kevin Yu. Yeah, the number's short for me. Why? Really? It's like, to me, I like Kevin Yu at 30, I just can't. I understand. And um, I, I grabbed Davis Thompson at 35. I have this weird feeling that Davis Thompson is just going to pop, even though the, the, there's not a ton of results there yet. But I feel like he's very talented. I've heard some good things about him. I know uh, some people that represent him that are very bullish on his future. So I keep betting him in these smaller events like okay. Mexico. And talented. Like, you know, he's a guy that can can just pound it and uh, maybe if he can roll a few putts in. Pass Palum's a tricky surface. I think it kind of levels the field in yeah. putting. You know, there's, a, there's it's a weird grass. I mean, it's obvious why they have to have it on these saltwater golf courses. It's a great invention, but it's kind of a strange, it's a different texture with the wide blade. And, yeah, it's pretty um, spongy. Yeah. Slower. Yeah, so uh, I think it kind, of, it, it kind of levels the field there a little bit in putting. So, there, Remember when Chris Goddard was 20-1 to 1 in Kentucky? I, was, I feel like Goddard's ago. kind of a good bet. He's been doing I things. I mean, he's, his iron play is a little inconsistent, but he can flash, you know, and um, he's kind of a guy that everybody was high on that, that we've forgotten about. I just what are his odds this week? Maybe we forgot about him. He's like 65? Yeah, I don't think that's a bad bet. Yeah, and then another name that uh, I think the number's down a little too, too short now, but um, – if you can just figure it out with the putter is Bud Cauley. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, here's a guy in four years, uh, you know, but, but can he win? I don't know. That's a good question. Just, anyone uh, can win in Punta Cana. Right? Like you could, anyone can win. I'm excited for Punta Cana this week. I, I've, I've been, I'll, I'll Vic lap, and I've had a lot of close calls in the alternate field event. No winner yet. I want a fucking alternate field winner. I love the alternate field events. I've been close. The process has been good at the alternate field events. So I need I need to see the ball go through the hoop in one of these. So I, I'm going to be dialed into Punta Cana this week. Maybe some cross-sport um, parlays, like entire RBC card parlayed with the entire Punta Cana card. Just kind of, you know, just you know, just a bankroll builder, you know, something to 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 uh, to get some money in my account. But uh, Brian, I really appreciate your time tonight. Um, enjoy your content on Twitter. Uh, enjoyed your Augusta National 
stories, breaking 80 at, at Augusta. Like I would tell everyone I know about that if, if I did that. And uh, hopefully we could win some bets this week. All right, Brian, thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure and uh, good luck. Yeah. Look yeah. Forward. Yeah. Probably no pod next week for the team event. Um, we shall see though, but most likely no pod. And then it's a pretty good stretch of golf. So We'll see everyone uh, next, Tib, and uh, good luck with all your bets this week.